there will be no real non-controlled currency in the world. Bitcoin is punk rock. Deal with it. You split, we bankrupt you. So do you use like you want to pay for things or not? No. Bitcoin Cash would be seen as more of a threat to the United States hegemony than Bitcoin. Miles Town, what's your favorite kind of money? Um, Bitcoin Cash. Hey guys, just as a disclaimer, there's a bit of connectivity audio issues uh, during this episode. So about 15 minutes in, uh, Hayden goes to sort that out. Jeremy and I just t- chat for a bit. And then about um, 17, close to 18 minutes in, the audio gets all sorted and fixed. So if that's annoying to you, feel free to skip ahead um, or just stick through it. Thanks. Hello and welcome back to the Bitcoin Cash podcast following Bitcoin Cash on its rise to global reserve currency. This is episode number 54, BCH past, present, and future featuring Hayden Otto. Today is Tuesday, the 19th of July, 2022. I'm your host, Jeremy Jett is producing the show. And our guest today is a Bitcoin Cash content producer, a freedom advocate an australian and he doesn't know this yet but uh, actually one of the inspirations for this podcast uh about when i was coming back into the scene about two years ago i had a look and uh, he had a great video which was called a decade of bitcoin what has been achieved or something like that and i watched that video it was really great and he's explaining all about uh, the history of bitcoin and everything and i was like this guy completely gets it uh, why doesn't he have a podcast every <laughs> week that goes into all this shit? And then I thought, why is it his job to have the podcast? Like, yeah, if I want this podcast, I just got to make it. So I did. But uh, very glad to have you on the show, man. Uh, welcome. And uh, yeah. yeah, who are you and how'd you get into Bitcoin for the listeners? Well, thanks for inviting me on, first of all. And also, thanks for all the compliments I don't, I don't even know if i would uh, describe myself as some of the things you mentioned but uh it's very flattering and uh yeah i'm just uh, a guy with a youtube channel and i've been pretty slack with the videos in recent times but i'm trying to step it up again and uh, yeah i've been a long time supporter of bitcoin cash since like day one I remember um, basically I was just starting to get more involved in the Bitcoin scene and the the big clashing of heads was occurring back in 2017. And it was pretty clear to me straight away uh, because like I was also coming from a a tech and like IT sort of background. So it was just like a no brainer that um, why are we uh, limiting ourselves to one megabyte blocks? And so, yeah, I went all in on BCH and um, the rest is history. Yeah, well, definitely, uh, there's a lot of history in there, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna walk through a little bit of that too, because I'm fascinated to hear some of your your takes on it. You're in the intro uh, to this podcast, you know, that we made for this year with at the VCH uh, the conference in Bangkok with with Craig Wright. I'm definitely gonna ask you about that. Uh, as well too but we'll get we'll get into all that in a minute so first things first we always have to touch on the price so this week bitcoin cash 115 dollars and 72 cents uh that was a couple hours ago i think it might even be up to 120 now one btc buys 188 bch so we're having our first green week in quite a long time actually uh both against the usd and against uh btc so the a bit of a reprieve there for everyone uh dying of thirst in the desert for some green candles we finally got a couple and maybe 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 this was the bottom maybe the coin flex drama was as bad as it got maybe crypto's turning the the quarter what do you think where are we at with the market moves recently um well i think this is not the And I think that later this year, we'll probably see some more downside, uh, mainly due to just the global macros and um, the fact that it 
we're basically in a recession already and uh, it's just going to get a lot worse uh, with all this inflation going on. Um, and I think that based on the charts, looking at the charts, I don't think it looks like a bottom at this stage. Um, and also this week, I think clearly some of the rallying that's going on is based on the Ethereum merge news. So, yes. Yeah. I think. Hello, Jet, you're still there? <laughs> Sorry, man, you're, dro you've, you're dro dropping out a little bit. But. Uh... Yeah, anyway, uh, I mean, I think the Ethereum merge stuff definitely is, is playing into it. Ethereum's been having a killer week. And interestingly, Ethereum Classic has also been making a bit of a run, which I think to me kind of shows that if the, you know, if the parent project or the, the one side of the fork is, is mixing it up either to the positive or to the negative side, then the other forks can also respond to that, right? So it's kind of actually good to see that because i think as bdc eventually goes more and more into into chaos or stagnancy which is just constantly doing sooner or later there's going to be a problem that they have where everyone thinks oh you know bitcoin cash is still around like maybe maybe, maybe that's maybe. actually the answer uh it takes people a long time to figure that out but it's going to happen uh at some yeah. point i feel like maybe that's just my hope you might have yeah <laughs> i still have some hope in as well um you know i've tried some times and i think it's i'm just always disappointed with the experience like high fees and um having to wait for the transaction to get mined in a block and stuff like this um particularly with ethereum that's mainly what i've been delving into more and um yeah Cash has a way superior user experience compared to these other coins. So it, it really just makes no sense why more people are not interested in it and using it. Um, but I think the number go up. Uh, this is probably the reason why they probably don't transact it outside the exchanges. Well, that's it. That's exactly what it is. The only reason that people are unaware of all this stuff is because they, they don't, they literally don't actually use their own product. You know, it's called uh, dog fooding in the, in the tech world, I'm sure you know about that. You know, you've got to eat your own, eat your own food. You've got to use your own product, and they they don't. Basically, that's why you argue with people on Reddit. You think, what planet are these people living on? Why why are they <laughs> why are they not understanding what I'm talking about? And it's always essentially just a, a combination of lacking historical context and not using their own their own tools or, or whatever and uh somebody was pointing out that the the lightning network subreddit or whatever is just a mess of people constantly being like this is broken like this is not working how do i get this to work etc cetera, etc cetera. so yeah eventually eventually people give this stuff a try and then maybe it suddenly makes sense to them i don't know but uh the real crypto community definitely in bitcoin cash you never have anybody there who doesn't actually understand about transacting in in crypto so yeah we're of course preserving that that ethos as much as as much as it's about the technology and stuff it's not even really about that it's it's more about the community mentality and the expectations i think uh that that make a huge difference right so we've got then the transaction count uh, which we look at every week, still kind of flat, still like 30K. And I've been hanging out to see this start to kick off a little bit. I mean, we are in the bear market, so that does partially explain it. But I'm really revved up for some actual new apps and things to come on to online. One thing I did consider this week actually was that this graph is just the main chain. And if we added in the smart BCH transactions as well, it would show over the last year that it has been growing there, maybe more on the on the smart BCH side as well too. Even with the recent drama, it's been uh, actually doing pretty decently, but there's not actually a lot of great places to get stats. There was the Grafana site, but that's been down and so on and so forth. So at some point I do need to hopefully find someone in the community who's working on some 
some stats and you actually made a really good video i used it today i used the block ng bridge to uh get some coins back i had a, a few dollars on smart bch that i transferred onto the main chain actually just to see what the experience of the bridge was and they've been doing a killer job with that and yeah your video explaining how the the bridge works and demonstrating and stuff was absolutely golden it's got about five and a half thousand huh. views so people are people are actually interested what do you make of the transactions and the kind of yeah blockchain analysis and the bridge and everything at the moment? Um, yeah, I definitely think that um, most of well, it seemed like most of the like attention explorer websites you're able to see how much transactions were happening. So you have to check that. I'm not entirely sure. Um, there, there's a fair bit of growth going on and it seemed to slow down only when uh, we had news like oh, um, the bridge, the decentralized bridge is getting delayed and uh, I think people were becoming a bit more hesitant then that they were wanting to wait until this bridge came out in order to uh, like put more money in or some guys on Reddit uh, were really against getting involved altogether until the decentralized bridge came. So <clears throat> unfortunately that has not happened. And also as a result of that, this coin flex situation happened. So yeah, what was going on uh, behind the scenes there. But uh, if I was involved in that or in charge of that, I would have put a far greater priority on releasing that. As yeah, I think with the decentralized bridge I, I mean i'm there still seems to be good work being done on that and things are progressing sort of in the right direction but it, it was such a pity that things couldn't have just held out at coinflex just a little bit longer a couple more months if it had just run all smoothly it would have been this amazing transition but i guess things always take longer than you expect in software development and things always blow up in crypto so that was kind of a bad um combo and all the people who were skeptical and who were saying look why don't we just wait for the decentralized bridge and i'm not going to put all that much money in it or i'm not that interested until we have that did prove to be vindicated so i think it was actually in, in one sense it was good that our community was quite skeptical of that stuff maybe even like par paranoid and justifiably so it's just a community that's been through so much and this is just the latest thing so there's i guess there's a bit of leftover resilience there and i think the bounce back from the community has been better than i would have expected initially i guess all right we got the sent in usd as well i can see how that works <laughs> okay <laughs> Uh, we got the Sen in USD, uh, which is I'm hoping going to sort of capitulate again to see the the bottom of the market. It has dropped off a little bit this week, and it like you were saying, it could be more that at the end of this year we might be in for some more pain. Uh, it certainly doesn't seem from these these stats that things have really. Uh, leveled out at, at the bottom there but do you take a lot of notice of blockchain analysis type of stuff on-chain metrics do you you know do you really put a lot of faith in that technical analysis or are you just kind of like look fundamentals is what matters you can spend bitcoin cash that's the that's what really matters at the end of the day we good you're looking a, a little bit more stable there yeah, I, I'm not sure what the deal is. I'm actually on the Starlink internet, so All I'm right. not sure what's going on. It's supposed to be better. I think, um, well, uh, it, it definitely could have been worse. It's not that it's it's only just dropping out in like a couple of little segments. It, it gets like eight out of every 10 seconds of what you're saying and then drops out for about two. Yeah, I had some trouble hearing you before as well, so I'm not sure. Yeah. So blockchain analysis, do you, do you pay much attention to that or do you just go with fundamentals? What transaction is going to win in the end? Yeah, I, I don't look at much data, to be honest. Um, yeah, I'm more of a fundamentals person and 
based on my experience using the technology because um in the beginning as well like the thing that attracted me to this, this was the fact that I <laughs> yeah it was rolling there for a minute is there a problem again yeah it just dropped out again for another couple of seconds all right how about you talk to jet for like one minute i'll be back okay all right all right no worries jet how are you feeling about the scene this week what's your thoughts uh i actually have not been paying any attention just being sick i've been focused on my my gardening Oh, what are you, what are you, what are you doing in the garden? This is a bit of the, you, cause you started a chat about agorism, right? Yeah. And... Agorism. Like uh, I want to focus on anything that's uh, peer to peer related. So any kind of torrents or gray market kind of situations, uh, or if people want to do trade inside of that chat, that's all fine and dandy with me. Um, I figure part of that would be homesteading, just getting the reliance off of, uh, or maybe not even necessarily like the reliance off of something, but just getting a little more self-reliant. So uh, currently, because I got started pretty late in the season this year, I've got uh, beets, radishes, peas, kale. Um, I've got some uh, bunching onions and dill, um, cauliflower, and zucchini. I think that's everything. However... Oh, some everything. The goddamn snails keep eating my radishes. <laughs> You're gonna get uh, get the pesticides going, or is it all organic? <laughs> well, right now it's all organic. I have like, it's irritating too because it's a raised bed, so that should already keep some of it off. And then I have the copper tape, which is supposed to keep some of them off, and it's still like, they just keep munching. <laughs> the stale munches yeah i mean i'm not i don't know anything about any of this like self-sufficiency stuff creating your own home gardening i'm terrible with all of that i'm such a reliant on civilization type of person but it's the kind of thing i think i could get could get really into but i would need to own some property first and i'm kind of away away from that i think but that would be my first set would you got to get everything because it's not the kind of thing i could get into knowing like oh but i might be out of here in six months and then what's gonna happen why did i do all this effort for this garden or or whatever right well hopefully it'll encourage the next homeowner to not be uh the same lazy lawn growing piece of shit that the rest of the <laughs> the rest of the world is and and get something out of it i also have like like everything that I'm doing, I plan on leaving here. So, you know, it's a little, it's a sunk cost, sure. But um, I've got a tumbling composter set up and um, yeah, that that seems pretty decent so far. <laughs> exactly. You're back. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I'm, I've gone back to the crappy uh, ADSL copper internet. So let's F see. If fiber it's more to the reliable. node, mate. It's fiber to yeah, the node. That one rubbish. of the biggest, <laughs> one of the biggest scams in Australia, uh, among many. Uh, for for those who don't know. Well, anyway, let's let's just crack on then. What's our next uh, topic? I think first one was going to be talking about the history of BCH. So you already talked a little bit about getting into it but you were on the ground for a lot of this right uh particularly we have this video here of uh the when the bsv drama was in full swing and you went to the bangkok conference can you give us some insight from being there what what was that like i think this interview became a pretty uh, <laughs> meme worthy meme worthy occasion and certainly watching it back I don't know if you look at it differently now, but you're kind of struggling with the interview because you're you're trying not to like burst out laughing with some of the the stuff that he's saying and and being it's it's a funny dynamic because yeah I mean Australians are both very uh, generally very like blunt and to the point and also quite friendly, but uh, Craig is just so ridiculous that you're still struggling to hold it together. So well, yeah, what was this like? What I don't know if I've talked about this before, but like uh, 
I was extremely hungover when this video was filmed. And like it kind of just happened by accident because we were we went out and got some breakfast or whatever, and then we came back to the hotel lobby and he was just sitting there. And so yeah, we went and uh, we didn't know that he had just stormed out of the meeting at that stage. But uh, we went up to Craig and uh, struck up a conversation, and and then yeah, we we just interviewed him after that. He was like, no worries. So um, yeah, pretty funny. Um, but yeah, a lot of the quotes that he gave in that interview were pretty hilarious as well and um they came uh, they became memorable later on um stuff like the you you split and we bankrupt you and uh, i think he said something about jerking off onto the soggy <laughs> biscuits or something <laughs> it's been a while since i watched this video but uh yeah it was uh certainly pretty funny pretty interesting at that and, and so, then following the interview, we just uh, had drinks with him for a few more hours until his mates <laughs> came out of the meeting. And that was it. He left us with the bar tab as well. We had to, I had to pay for his expensive wine. Ah, uh, jeez. <laughs> so Satoshi yeah. Nakamoto but Thanks, can't Satoshi. afford to pay for his, uh, his wine. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty, pretty, pretty weird one. I mean, I, uh, yeah, I, I sort of, I don't know what to make of the whole Craig Wright. Th well, I know he's not Satoshi for sure, but the as as a character, he's such a character, and crypto is like that. It has a lot of characters uh, scattered throughout it. It does sort of have a magnetic appeal to people who are pretty eccentric, but he's certainly up there on the list of most out there. Um, do you think there's any difference or anything you know or took away from seeing him in person that you wouldn't have expected from watching his videos online? You know, people can often be have a different energy or something that you notice about them in person that that pe people might not get from from watching his <laughs> online rants. Yeah, um I First of all, I definitely think that he's deceiving people with like these Satoshi claims and everything that he's doing there. It's pretty clear. Um, but I would say that uh, when hanging around him or like uh, uh, hearing what he has to say about many things, it seems to like uh, be interesting. And I think this is part of the reason that... Uh, there's so many people that have become like attracted to uh, his cult and they now follow everything that he says is like gospel. Um, because yeah, I remember he, he was going on about some um, philosophical things at one point in the bar and I was like, Oh, that, that's kind of interesting. And yeah, he, he seems to put out a lot of, a lot of stuff like that. Um and uh, obviously, he likes to get on the piss as well. So <laughs> many people like to like to party or whatever. And uh, yeah, I don't know. This is, I would say, certainly not uh, not boring to hang around. But uh, at the end of the day, he's, he's trying to scam people, in my opinion. Yeah, it's certainly uh, you certainly think from from watching is. His stuff, yeah, he does seem like a very charismatic and engaging and energetic person, and that can be that could like people are not entirely rational or not even very rational at all, right? So sometimes that personality can just override. That's why there are scams and the Tinder swindler and like whatever crap there is in the world, right? A lot of it just comes down to people who just get involved in something just because the person who's selling them whatever is saying it with such conviction and such charisma and whatever that they think well this must be right this guy seems seems really smart and i think a lot of what craig says it's wrong but you only know that it's wrong if you can sort of thread the needle of okay this this one part of it doesn't match up with this other part of it or there's a technical detail there that you doesn't know or something so it's quite hard to find those um 
incorrect threads in what he's saying. And then anybody who's trying to interview him or point out those holes, it, uh, he's often just sort of trying to override them by just talking more or acting offended in this weird way uh, <laughs> to try and make it like socially awkward to call him out, whether he knows that that's what he's doing or not, or it's just a, just how he naturally has developed as a defense mechanism. I don't know, but yeah, I certainly get those, those impressions from him too, but I'm sure he's a laugh to have a beer with. So <laughs> I do envy the you other too, thing but... um, on a more serious note, the other thing that I uh, liked at the time when he was like involved in BCH was how he would be very aggressively pushing back against the BTC maximalists. And nobody was really doing it that hard as he was. And I felt that uh, part of the reason that we ended up in the situation that we did with like a fork that was not BTC um, uh, being the big block version, I felt that was because we had very weak leadership and the people that were in charge at the time, like Bitcoin Unlimited, were very weak and they were not um, competent enough or like aggressive enough in their pushback. And so when this guy turned up and he was uh, basically doing what needed to be done in that regard, I, th I thought that was uh, worth getting behind to some extent. Yeah. yeah, and it's one of the ironic things i think that will be much discussed or in as in hindsight it will be analyzed more and more was i often feel like much aside from anything and there was a lot of reasons but one of the main reasons that the big block is lost in the block size war was essentially that it was the more decentralized side which is quite ironic that this whole war the the small block side they already had the centralized stuff organized, basically. It was like they've got Bitcoin Core. They had their little group of insiders that were all teamed up. They had Blockstream set up with, you know, who, whoever knew whoever and whatever was going to be the party line. Everyone was on the same page. They had Thamos just shutting off the distraction. So BCH or the big blockers was already the more uh, spread around site. Like I didn't know anybody... I was not involved in any different. I was just a guy posting on Reddit, right? And there was loads of people in that sort of situation where even as a collective, the mass opinion was quite clear. But on the other hand, there, there wasn't all those links and in-person contacts and so on and so forth. So once you started throwing some chaos into the mix with censoring people and doing all these weird delays and this and that, it just, you know, a, a decentralized resilience mechanism is very slow acting but then very effective once it's kind of like grown around whatever the whatever the problem is so yeah that makes sense that at the time at least somebody coming in and just saying look <laughs> we're not going to put up with this bullshit and kind of being um very blunt and direct in that way and giving people a, a sort of figurehead to rally around could have been attractive although of course in the end it also turned out for the worst where he ended up forking himself onto his own chain so i don't know i guess that's that's something that bch has always lacked a little bit was well it's one of the few coins that it's hard to actually associate it with anybody you know i mean except for roger is <laughs> well known yeah. for being like the number one guy for it right but if you actually know the scene at all, it's not like he's calling the shots and that's it. Like it might be on some other chains, right? Well, yeah, outside, he came, he's the he one came like months it. late. He yeah. came months late to BCH as well. So, yeah, but they think many people outside think that he created it. So yeah. That's obviously that not true. the one and it's all, yeah, put on him. And that's why I feel like if, you know, BCH can get a bit of a renaissance and have, a bunch of new voices, then they, they, it won't be possible to just character assassinate them as just the same people over and over again because it, it's all easy if it can all be pinned onto him. But, you know, in, in, in reality, the more different people there are, the more that 
like it's very strange that everybody always is going on about decentralization in crypto but then if you have a very decentralized currency maybe it lacks a a driving force or an, it's not easy to just grasp onto as like, oh, this person is the one and they're saying this and that's what everyone's doing. Um, yeah, kind of ironic in that way. And so then, yeah, you made this uh, video, 10 years of uh, Bitcoin that I think that was at a meetup in 2019. And yeah, I personally, when I watched that, I just thought this is it. Like Bitcoin Cash is still there. People still get it and it all makes sense. What, what were you doing at that time in terms of meetups and um, were people responding well to that? Or was it like, I, I'm talking to, you know, people with like sand in areas or something? No, yeah. Um, I was just trying to, you know, step up and uh, inform people about the fact that uh, this is actually what Bitcoin was really all about in the previous years. Uh, it was never this store of value, digital gold thing that only emerged uh, later on. And um, obviously that's not true either. But uh, I used to run yeah, meetups pretty regularly. These days I don't uh, run meetups anymore. Uh, I can't even remember when the last time I did it, probably more than a year ago. But um, uh, yeah, when I lived in the larger city, there was like a, a, a good interest in people coming to those sorts of events. So um, it was easy to do. And uh, yeah, we ran them pretty regularly, actually. Um, also, we would have generally uh, a local merchant, like some bar or something that we would all go to afterwards. And so uh, it was a good place to show people that you can actually spend it and the merchant was willing to accept. Um, in some cases, what we would do is that uh, if the merchant just wanted to like kind of trial it, something like that, um, basically we would just open like a bar tab and everyone would pay with BCH, but we would set the cash register to direct those funds to the wallet of whoever was paying for the bar tab. And so it was a good way to buy uh, Bitcoin cash at market rate as well for that person. Um, so that's one trick that we used to do. And um, yeah, I would say um, in recent times, my opinion on certain things has changed and therefore I don't, think there I don't put as much importance on like trying to convince people that BCH is like oh the one or whatever like we're well beyond that point now and um, also I don't um, put as great an importance or I don't have as much of an interest I should say in uh, merchant adoption I feel like um, uh, we're at a point now where quite clearly the winner of um, the adoption field is these uh, Visa and MasterCard, uh, like crypto debit card things. This seems to be what everyone is going towards. And there's a number of, uh, like, even though it's not ideal, I don't like the fact that you have to KYC to use it and it's still relying on this third party um there are a number of benefits to it like the fact that uh, you don't have to convince a merchant to accept first of all you can spend it anywhere and uh, also you don't have to deal with any of the problems that uh, uh, you would have to deal with on the merchant end for example they accept the coin they're holding the coin and then the price goes down and then they come and complain about the fact that they just lost a bunch of money um, so, yeah, there are many problems with uh, accepting it peer-to-peer -peer that no one ever talks about. And um, this uh, Visa MasterCard way is bypassing all of that. And so I think that's just the reality. They have uh, won at this stage. And maybe the peer-to-peer -peer adoption will make a comeback at some point in the future when people realize the importance of that 
and have a greater need for that. Um, but right now, that's just not the reality. And I think that uh, ignoring the reality is uh, is not a good approach to take. Yeah, I mean, I think the the whole merchant onboarding and so on and so forth, I think it's a good idea. And I think it's important that we have these uh, pockets of the community that are working on that because they are slowly building up better tools and processes and ways to overcome objections and so on and so forth. But I don't think that can be the, you need more than that in your strategy, right? And maybe there was too much time and attention put into that in like in locations where it wasn't suited to be the method of adoption. For instance, the whole Ethereum has just, you know, exploded with just having MetaMask and being this sort of online casino and that was just flooding in people everywhere, right? And so I think like with this podcast, for instance, part of the reason that I like it is because Bitcoin Cash has so many, it's it's like quite a detailed thing. Any other stupid coin you can figure out, you just, okay, I downloaded this wallet. Okay, I gambled. Okay, my money went up or it went down and I'm wrecked. And you're just in this sea lost with what's going on. But with BCH, you need to understand the history. You need to understand how it works. You need to understand the whole mission and the concepts and Satoshi and all this sort of stuff. And so, yeah, this podcast can just go out to everyone or in the world. And hopefully the merchant adoption comes from just people who already believe in the coin, who are the merchants. And then they say, look, I'll accept this as payment. Or you get to such a critical mass of consumers that it becomes obvious. You just, everybody's just like, oh, everybody else has crypto. Like, why can't I get paid in crypto? But the the window for having the critical merchant advantage, at least, you know, um, in places where they already have a good payments infrastructure, it's, it's certainly an uphill battle. I agree with that. And then what, well, what about, tell me, what do you, what do you think about the whole uh, Townsville setup? Because for many years you were in there and, doing the Bitcoin Cash uh, City Conference and everything. What What is it actually? I still haven't got a chance to visit, but I'm planning to go at the end of the year when I, um, I'm i back in Oz for for Christmas. What, what What's it like on the ground there? Um, well, the main number one problem that I identified when I was involved in that is the fact that there is not enough customers that actually come and spend the Bitcoin Cash. And basically, when you get to a point where you have more merchants than customers, many of these merchants are like never seeing any use beyond the first day that they got onboarded. And this is a huge problem. And many of these merchants just basically like stop accepting because they forgot all about it because no one is using it. And um, other problems are like, yeah, as I mentioned before, the fact that uh, the price is going down and many of them don't like this. Uh, obviously, when that happens, there's really no benefit to having accepted it in the first place. You're just losing money. And so um, I would say continuing to pursue uh, onboarding more merchants is basically like taking two steps, um, oh, sorry, taking one step forward and you always go two steps back because there's like merchants dropping off um, due to lack of users. And there's really no point in continuing to onboard more businesses unless that there, uh, there is more people willing to go and spend. Um, so that's what I found in my experience dealing with merchant adoption. And I think that a lot of people making posts on Reddit about adoption are not being genuine about that like they like to post oh we just onboarded somebody and try and hype it up and then they never mention any of the bad stuff or uh, negative stuff that uh, they don't want people to hear yeah well and i mean that's... i can only speak for what i've been involved with personally i don't know what what it's like in the saint kitts area and places like that but uh, based on my experience in uh, one area i would suspect that it's pretty similar uh, across the board. Yeah, I think that's something that seems to have been a like sticking point that the community hasn't cracked. Like there have been these 
areas where it's been possible at least to get even if just for a short time or with a lot of effort to get a good number of merchants but the kind of the other part of the cycle seems to be the bit that isn't clicking right that you can go to somebody you can explain it to them they can understand it the tools are even there and work and everything like that but then it's just not there's not a you know it's the chicken and egg problem and so if you don't have both halves of that going at once and that's where it seems to you know again i i don't know the details of either half of this problem really that's not the way i've attacked uh onboarding people to crypto for the mo- for the most part but if it, it seems to me like you need a two-pronged strategy where, like you said, with the meetups, if you already have a group of a meetup and a group of people that are end consumers, and then you have a merchant, then it starts to work. And then everybody kind of sees some of the benefits and the community building of the consumer base in a, in a city seems to often be overlooked as a, a complementing fact to the, to the merchant network. Um, but again, it's, it's all easier said than done, I guess. Yeah. Uh, as as On the flip like side, um, I have seen in like the last year or so, this go crypto payment terminal. And I think something like that is pretty attractive. And I think something like that should be promoted to merchants more than, for example, Bitcoin cash register and the Bitcoin.com wallet. Um, the fact is it just offers a far better experience for the merchant. You don't have to, it basically eliminates a lot of the problems that you get um, with the alternative. And uh, one of the major ones is the fact that um, they can choose to basically convert it instantly to their local fiat currency. And um yeah, the terminal and everything accepts other payment methods as well, like the Apple Pay or Visa and MasterCard, whatever whatever people want to use. Um, and so I think uh, that to me looks like the best kind of uh, best kind of way ahead, if you will, um, to try and get more businesses to accept uh, the BCH. Um, And I'm not sure exactly. I do believe they offer other coins as a payment method on there, but it's like the merchant can choose which ones they want to accept. Um, That's okay. Um, I I found that these multi-coin point of sale systems, unless there's like training, then the staff don't really know how to use it and it's all confusing. Um, But as long as they got training, I think it's okay. Um, And uh, yeah, obviously, if they're using that for Visa and MasterCard as well, then that would be like their main device. And so I think everyone uh, would have a better grip of how to use it in that case. Yeah, it seems like (laughs) slowly but surely uh, things are progressing in the right direction. Although I often sort of get the sense that a lot of the... uh, you know, it, again, it just all comes back to the block size war and all everything like that because there was merchants getting signed up and there was so much like traction and momentum and uh, all that. If that at all just kept rolling, it would have been a completely different story. But being in the situation of having just a smaller community and having to rebuild everything from scratch and having to fight internally so much and whatever, it was just like the time and resources didn't didn't really end up in 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 perfecting this. So about about that, I also wanted to ask about the whole abc uh fork and everything there too because i know you made a one uh, like kind of one or two videos about that that i watched right before i got back into bitcoin cash as well too and you made a really interesting like strategy where you actually supported the abc side but you said whoever wins the brand name that's who i'm gonna go with which is actually quite unusual. A lot of once these community rifts and tensions start, people sort of tend to dig in on one side. And then after the fork, it's kind of like, well, our side's going to be the better side. Screw you guys. But you said beforehand and then stuck to a promise that you thought, I don't know, did you think the network effect was more important or why did you, why did you uh, approach it that way? Yeah, because, um, Obviously, we learned with the BTC split that basically um, 
we were put at a major disadvantage due to the fact that we did not retain the Bitcoin name and the BTC ticker. And I knew that if there was going to be another split, that would happen again, because obviously we saw it with BSV. Um, I just don't think that uh, there's going to be like a very little percentage chance that uh, a new coin is going to, that hasn't retained the branding, is going to come in front in the end. And um, that's just the reality of the situation, as we've learned with, with uh, BCH and BTC now. Um, but uh, BCH has come a fairly long way, and it's got support on um, a number of the major systems like BitPay, the Coinbase Pay, and things like that. And so that's why uh, I think it has better odds in the end. Uh, it just comes down to that. Yeah. And I think you do need to be 100x better to flip the majority side of the fork and we can be 100x better than BTC because they've <laughs> capped themselves off basically so they've yeah. kind of screwed themselves and it hasn't all come to pass but like for people like we we're talking about people who actually use crypto bch already is can be up to 100 times uh better especially if all the smart bch and everything all gets rolling if a bit of momentum and energy comes into the scene you know we can just blow them away if we yep. rebuild that momentum but yeah i can't see any way that an even smaller fork would be a hundred times better than both BCH and BTC. It just seems uh, seems kind of impossible to me. I gotta say. Yeah, and while I did like um, the, their plan for some of the things they wanted to do, they wanted to like get more funding into various projects uh, on the chain. Uh, I don't think that was enough on its own to uh, yet yeah, come out in front in the end. So I, I value the um, the uh, the support on a lot of these larger platforms and things like that a lot more than uh, just this funding thing on its own. And um, yeah, as we have seen so far, I don't know that eCash has been performing that well, but um, I haven't really been paying too much attention there. Uh, obviously. Bitcoin Cash has not been performing that well either. So uh, <laughs> who knows? But uh, uh, I can still use Bitcoin Cash on a, a wide variety of services. And uh, I think that's what's pretty important to me. Yeah, getting a decisive lead is certainly <laughs> certainly a tricky thing uh, to manage. One of, the, one of the downsides of decentralization, <laughs> I guess it worked in mysterious ways. <laughs> Okay, so that was all the past. Now we got the present. So today we're obviously in the CoinFlex uh, aftermath. Uh, so anybody who needs to go watch episode 52 and 53, we covered all this in a ton of detail. But basically the latest uh, news or the latest uh, sa chapter in the saga is that CoinFlex have reopened with 10% withdrawals mm -hmm. to people. So you can get out 10% of your money, but, and there's a very big catch, which is that by signing into the platform to get this 10% out, you're accepting their new terms and conditions, which includes a uh, bit about all your coins getting liquidated into USDC. So maybe you don't mind about that and you just want to get your 10% out and then see what happens with the rest of it. But some people are also in the position of kind of thinking, well, if I don't sign in at all, then maybe I I have grounds to later like sue CoinFlex as to what did you do with all my crypto? Like the terms and conditions I initially signed didn't say anything about that. And I didn't want you to liquidate <laughs> me into USDC. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of, kind of a, a sticking point. Nobody knows what's going to happen there. And also they added some terms about merging sub accounts together, which adds some sort of weight to a kind of theory that, well, maybe Roger had two accounts and he had one account where he was in the negative and he needed to add the margin, which maybe he did refuse to do, or they had some problems about that. But then he had another account that was positive and maybe they just merged the accounts to uh, bring it all together. But he you know, felt like that wasn't fair or 
something like that uh, could also be part of the problem. So, yeah, what's been your take on the whole Queen Flex situation? Uh, I think it has been extremely bad news for Bitcoin Cash. Like, it obviously six months ago just felt like, yeah, we we've got this smart BCH and uh, we're we're like coming back. This is looking really bullish. And then, uh, of course, something like this had to happen once again. Obviously, we can't get ahead. Uh, and now, yeah, obviously, faith in smart BCH. I don't think people outside would look at it as something that's attractive now. Um, obviously, a lot of people that are still involved in it are still faithful about it. But uh, I don't see how even even when we get a decentralized bridge, even then it might still be negatively impacted by this situation. And yeah, with uh, with CoinFlex, I think, you know, both parties involved, uh, both CoinFlex and both Roger are both at blame here. And I think they haven't given us the full story. Obviously, uh, CoinFlex have been giving us a fair bit of information and all Roger does is just uh, says, oh, there's an NDA and uh, I don't owe them money and they owe me money. And so, I don't know, I'm more inclined to believe uh, what CoinFlex is saying because they're giving us more information. And uh, some of the information, uh, well, a lot of the information they're giving, like I don't believe that they would lie about because roger could then come after them and sue them for like defamation or something like that so i think they they are probably being pretty careful with what they're saying about it uh, but what they are saying about it uh seems to implicate roger uh as the main cause of this problem and yet for whatever reason he is uh he thinks that they have done something wrong by him and this is why he's refusing to pay based on principle, but he's not willing to give that information publicly. And yeah, uh, yeah. until then we can only guess and speculate. Um, but CoinFlex, what they have been saying seems to make sense at the moment. And yeah, maybe something like what you said before, them liquidating his uh, flex holdings that were on the platform there maybe he has some dispute about about that um that leads him to believe that he doesn't owe them money and they owe him money so yeah i do i personally try and yeah favor explanations where both both of them sort of from their point of view can be seen as being in the right i don't think either of them are intentionally necessarily trying to fraud everyone I think the community has been a, definitely a little harsher on CoinFlex in terms of just saying you guys are scamming. And that makes sense because they are the ones who the coins were deposited with. So, you know, they can sort of say, well, if you've got issues with Roger, that's your own, you know, that's your own fight. Like, leave us yeah, out. Yeah, exactly. And I think there's also an element that, you know, well, I guess CoinFlex probably are not in that position, but like Roger maybe could just say, like, fuck coin flex but look let me just give you like the money here the bridge is backed again now the community's like sorted i mean that would be obviously a lot to ask and who knows what happens with coin flex but to the extent that they're both involved and that they've dragged everyone in the scene into it uh by proxy uh, it's just yeah it's just a bit of a mess but i do have some good news for you in terms of the uh of the confidence in the bridge being rattled which is that I don't I think that smart BCH is far less known outside of Bitcoin Cash than we actually believe it is. And so in the way in the same way that everything in crypto just moves on and in six months' time or a year's time, everybody's forgotten whatever garbage happened, like all the projects that went bust and all whoever scammed, whatever, like a lot right. of the time that all gets just sort of swept under the rug. It's one of the benefits think- of BCH being niche is that uh, that's a niche in a niche you know maybe not a lot of people were aware of it right i think that'll happen as long as um as long as everyone gets their money back basically yeah. 
<laughs> that's the big, the big, the big, uh, big if, but uh, one that's not you know entirely out of the realm of possibility. So we got to we got to cling to that. And on this other, uh, on the next slide we've got here, this other sort of weird aspect to this, where this this kind of came out this letter about the Smart BCH Foundation to represent particular Smart BCH parties impacted by the CoinFlex insolvency, published July eleventh. So this is uh, that we mentioned on the last episode a little bit, but this is this foundation uh, supposedly, which was established in March of 2022 in Zug, Zug, Switzerland. Uh, and Kui Wang was aware that they were founded, he said, but he also said that he's not involved. The board consists of Peter Ning, Stefan Rust, and Patrick Storchenegger. Uh, probably butchered those names. <laughs> Sorry if anybody <laughs> list, listening. <laughs> but I, they, anyway, they published this letter saying that basically they're going to try and represent the smart BCH community. But I don't, I don't really know what what's going on with this or where they came from. And they said, look, we were planning to do this big launch, but now this has happened, and so we're just getting straight into the mix, trying to recover everyone's coins uh so i don't know what 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 do you make of this little uh I th- everything i'm fairly confident that it is legit um because uh the guys behind it uh, i know peter uh personally he is legit and trustworthy so um if he's involved in that it seems to me that he is like um the lead person involved in this um so i would say that it's a trustworthy and legit thing um but yeah a lot of people uh, might not be aware of who they are and therefore the skepticism is healthy and warranted um but yeah i don't really know what they're what they're planning to do or what they are doing right now but um i think the more people that are putting pressure on coinflex to return the funds the better i think that um potentially part of the reason why they are holding on to the coinflex funds uh, sorry why they're holding on to the smart bch funds is because they may be trying to apply pressure onto Roger um, in order to get him to pay his debt. And um, who knows, potentially, we don't know until we see their balance sheets, but who knows, they might be so screwed that they're just now trying to take this and um, use it to use the smart BCH funds to help fill the hole that they're in. Um, it could be a combination of both of those things. Who knows? Yeah, I guess we'll we don't see know if, yet. Yeah, that's right. And the uh, well, I'm glad to hear that's some good news at least. If you're kind of vouching for this smart BCH foundation, again, I don't know. Maybe these are well-known people, and I just don't know them. That's certainly uh, possible. And I do agree that it's probably can't probably not going to hurt having more people basically trying to get the money back. Because whatever Coinflex does to release the money, I can also not see them just handing it out to anybody who didn't. They would presumably they would make some kind of proposal or announcement to the community, like, uh, you know, what if we give the money to these people or in this decentralized multi-sig setup or like whatever before they did it. I can't just the last thing I can see them well, is just handing away the coins to somebody willy-nilly. So. Yeah, the other thing is, uh, I think this foundation uh, is an entity that has like some some teeth. It's got uh, money behind it, and it has uh, uh, the ability to get. Well, they already are. They've got lawyers involved um, who will be able to initiate uh, legal proceedings against Coinflex. So um, that is one benefit of that. I guess as well, instead of just like oh, a bunch of guys in the Telegram group, <laughs> like that is that's good as well. It's good to discuss things and have information. But I don't know. It seemed to be a lot of people just like waiting around, like oh, who's going to sue them first and stuff like that. Um, so I guess this 
kind of foundation is useful in that regard. Uh, Richard Mullins points out in the chat, Stefan Rust used to work for Roger. So again, who knows what's going on behind the scenes there, but any kind of yeah uh, pressure or any any work to get the coins back, certainly anybody who's doing that is doing a better job than I am in terms of Yeah, of he was back, Bitcoin... So. He was Bitcoin.com CEO for maybe like a year or so, but um, All right. he hasn't been involved there for a while now, maybe like two years. Okay. Well, I guess, yeah, at least he's uh, deep in the scene and yeah, sounds like he has some street cred for yeah, trying to at least keep the Bitcoin cash scene moving in the right direction. So I don't know. I don't know who yeah. this Patrick person is, but yeah, I know Stefan Rust and Peter. But yeah. All right. There we go. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll keep the listeners posted if we get any uh, update out of them. But if they manage to fish the coins out of there uh, and re-back the bridge, that would be absolutely brilliant. So speaking of that, we've got a little segment here from uh, outside the Bitcoin Cash community getting some takes on this whole CoinFlex thing. I literally just heard this this morning when I happened to be listening to some crypto content. So this comes from Up Only, which is this actually massive crypto uh, podcast. And these guys, Kobe and Ledger. So they have like hundreds of thousands of Twitter followers and 30,000 um, Twitch followers and all these YouTube views and everything. And they're pretty coin agnostic and they just take a look at all what's going on in crypto overall. So they ended up doing this kind of five minute segment about this whole CoinFlex situation. And I thought it was worth, I, I don't like having too many big segments of other shows or whatever in there, but I thought this one would be quite relevant to get a sense of how the whole CoinFlex situation appears from the outside. Because if you listen to this show, obviously we've picked over it in minute detail, but to the rest of crypto and the rest of the world, the actual drama is, is, you know, just kind of one of a long series of BlockFi and Voyager and Celsius and Terra and this and that. So to get a sense of how they think of it. So Jet, uh, line us up that clip. Yeah, I don't know. I just feel like there's just been, like everything that happens Send me the seems link. to be yeah. like the result of like a completely stupid decision. Like the CoinFlex thing with allegedly Roger <laughs> Ver gets liquidated. RVUSD. <laughs> Yeah, but they, they don't liquidate him because they have an agreement with him to pay back. Or can like, they liquidate him? Did they run negative on that account? So they th their statement um, said they had an agreement with this person who was of good standing. Um, Still going. Uh, Take and a break. They, like, they wouldn't ever liquidate him because he'll just top up the account or pay it back or whatever. Um, but clearly didn't have a plan for if he didn't do that. <laughs> yeah. It's like, what if he doesn't? It's like, it's not, it's not even like multiple order of magnitudes. You know, using leverage to think, and it's just with like, Bcash on coin what flex, happens if which was a bad path um, happens? Bcash what happens if the person does not do that? What happens if the price goes down? Yeah. Like they're not, <laughs> well, they're not like, they're just simple questions. Um, and it seems like every one of these like major losses or major fuck ups, would have been prevented with someone answering some simple questions and going, hmm, should we cater to these things? But maybe those are the lenders or those are the people you don't hear about because the people that asked the question didn't lend out any money and therefore didn't have active businesses or something. Yeah. And I wonder too, like, does it make it different if, you know, Bcash has been going down for a long time. So if Roger was consistently, you know, using leverage with Bcash on CoinFlex, which was a, uh, a Bcash friendly exchange in the first place, if I recall correctly. Like maybe he posted collateral five times in a row and so they thought it was okay. And then it's like, hey man, your 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 bill's getting a little bigger here. You're underwater pretty bad. And now he then he rugs them on the sixth time. Um that seems like a reasonable outcome as well, where your your risk it could be all right up front and it's like, okay, it's ten million. We have twenty million dollars in, in freestanding, you know, insurance fund money or whatever you want to call it. So it's like, it's all right. And it's like, Hey, Hey, uh, now it's 20. Uh, hey, Hey, now it's, Roger, Roger, somebody call Roger, <laughs> Roger. Hey, you owe us $30 million. And then all of a sudden they realize they're totally screwed. And, and now what? 
This is, again, all speculation. Yeah, I mean, who knows, man? It just seems all pretty stupid. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Roger, I, I, don't, I don't remember if this is real or not, but in my head, I had that Roger had 400,000 Bitcoin. Like, when I first heard about Roger, when I got into crypto, he was like, you know, Bitcoin Jesus or whatever people called him. Um, yeah. And he was on these lists of people that had, like, loads of Bitcoin. And I remember Max Kaiser had, like, 250,000 Bitcoin Whoa. and Roger had 400,000 Bitcoin. And like, who knows? These numbers might have been made up. They might be fake. Like, you know, who knows? But if he had 400,000 Bitcoin, that was 30 billion at the top. Um, obviously, he went all in Bcash and like, you know, he will have sold some along the way because it's a long journey if your entire net worth is in a, a fictional internet coin. Um, but it's pretty crazy, like, outcome variance, isn't it, from like, 30 billion in December to like getting liquidated and can't post margin for a $47 million B cash long. Well, this week, surely he was, he was liquidating his Bitcoin to try to prop up B cash along the way. You think he would? Yeah. 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 Possibly. Yeah. I remember he would like, I remember he tweeted something. Oh, I don't remember. I don't remember exactly, but I remember there was like a point where he bought 20,000, Bitcoin's worth of Bcash. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, nobody had to wonder very much back when those Bcash, like, vertical candles, like, plus 40% in two hours. Like, nobody really wondered where those were coming from. So they were probably just mass conversions from, you know, his Bitcoin stash to, to, to Bcash. I'd love to see a Bitcoin Satoshi's vision to Bcash chart. I just don't know what it'll look like. <laughs> Which one's down the worst? I, I don't know. We can look it up. I'd have to mess with some uh, stuff here. I was just playing on a split screen, but we can we could try it if you want me to rug the. You've got to imagine that like BSV was down the worst, and then in the la like last three or four months, it's like massively outperformed <laughs> Bcash. That's why I'm guessing like BSV down like well, Celsius it was, chart like it was already at zero. So it was already at zero. So on a relative basis, it's you know still yeah, yeah, at yeah. zero while Bcash goes down. Uh, so do you think that they distributed this? They did the, it's kind of like what Bitfinex did after the hack, right? With the si simulated coupon for a dollar and CoinFlex did the RVUSD. Do you think they did it because they were insinuating that it was a Roger Ver debt coupon? They must have been. Yeah. Recovery value USD. That's no one talks like that. <laughs> it's gotta be Roger Ver USD. It's probably the best marketing they've ever done. Showing off their forty-seven million dollar exchange deficit. No, they sponsored Doug Polk's screen. Uh, oh, uh, did they YouTube sponsor Doug? Too. Oh man, I bet Doug feels yeah. bad about that because he loves uh, loves staying on the straight and narrow. Yeah, his content's quite funny. I yeah, watched he, it. And Doug's laughed. great. Um, somebody in the yeah. So who knows? But uh, it just seems pretty stupid. Um, uh, yeah. Anyway, so. I think that kind of gives a flavor for how this drama all seems from the outside, which is that basically, once again, obviously in this case, it does heavily involve Roger, but that's kind of the central element of the story. It's not about CoinFlex, smart pieces, or only tangentially, smart BCH didn't get a mention at all. The kind of bridge funds element, not really uh, mentioned it at all. And the kind of element of BSV, also another infamous kind of Bitcoin fork. So that's that's really from the outside how Bitcoin Cash looks that, okay, it's just Roger's coin with a, you know, they had their own dramas with Bitcoin SV that they essentially kicked out, but the price has been going down and who cares about it? And like, that, that's the end of the story, right? So obviously I don't believe that that's all that's happening in the sounding. There's a lot going on besides that but it, it just really gives some perspective that even in the crypto bubble B bch is still not very known and perhaps in this one instance it might do us uh, a bit of a favor if nobody really knows too much about the smart bch stuff and then we get it all fixed up and by the time the the hype train rolls around i don't know any 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 thoughts on this hayden um well i agree with some of the assessment that they made there like i think that rvusd is uh standing for roger via 
uh, for example, like that's just uh, too strange of a coincidence. I think this was intentional. Again, probably to put pressure on him. Um, but yeah, I think uh, they, they were trying, they were talking about uh, whether they think, oh, is Roger like lost all his money or whatever. Uh, I don't think that is the case. I think that uh, obviously maybe uh, he doesn't have as much uh, liquid coins or whatever laying around, but he certainly still got um, like shares in companies, like major crypto companies that would be worth uh, billions in total. Like he's investor in Coinbase and Kraken and Ripple, like all these companies, blockchain.com. Um, yeah, there's no way that he's like, he's broke. He's got the money. But um, there's just some issue that uh, we haven't heard his side of the story yet. Um, some issue that I think he's being very stubborn about and uh, is the reason why he's not paying this debt. Um, and yeah, we don't, we can only speculate what that is at this stage. Yeah. I think it's some, definitely... some, something based on his, his principle or whatever that, um, he thinks is unjust and therefore is not, uh, willing to pay. That's yeah, what I, I think, think. I think it's definitely the case that the, yeah, this sort of take that, oh, he's out of money and that's why he can't pay. That's another element to it that they sort of seem to have been lost in translation or they misconstrued rather than it seems it's more like he he's not willing to pay <laughs> it's not like the, the bank account is or the, you know the wallet is empty and he's got no coins to send them if he if he wanted to be i also cannot see that being the case in any circumstance but it just goes to show that even if you're just one or two steps removed like we don't obviously necessarily have the best information, but then when you zoom out to a bit more of the general crypto casino type of coverage, it, the signal to noise drops off even there. And then once you take it a step further out to any kind of mainstream coverage, or it's probably not even mentioned at all there, but any other takes on it, it's going to be even less of what's actually going on. So I just thought it was an interesting example of how, things look different when you're deeply you know involved and affected versus if it's just something happening off on the the yeah, periphery sure. of your understanding all right so speaking about all that then let's talk about the future that was that was the past and the present where do you think bgh is going in in the future is this coinflex stuff gonna gonna work out are you optimistic about that are you pessimistic about that what about things that are not you know, uh, this whole drama, Are you optimistic or pessimistic? Uh, why or why not? Uh, well, previously in the video that I put on YouTube, I said, I think there's like a 50, 50 chance we'll be getting our money back. Um, the longer it drags on, I think the less those chances are. And already I think those chances are a lot less quite frankly. Uh, because remember how they were saying uh, basically that the withdrawals would probably only be paused for about a week or week and a half or so, and they would open them. That didn't happen. Now we're like many weeks later after that, like three weeks later, I think, off the top of my head. Um, they've given us 10%, but that's that's basically nothing. And while I think... Uh, I don't know, maybe their intention was to try and give us something to like let us know that they're still working on it or whatever. I don't think it's had the intended effect. I think it has made people uh, less optimistic about it. I think uh, people are thinking, oh, well, I think what's important is that we need to get the, the information about their balance sheet and find out how much funds they hold. They said that they will give that. They haven't given it yet. Um, until we see that, no one's going to know like how bad the damage is going to be. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I think that uh, if according to the CoinFlex story, uh, if their story is accurate and true, I think there's probably a good chance they can get uh, or use the court or whatever to get the money from Roger. Um, but that's obviously going to take a long time to deal with. It uh, could take years. Uh, but uh, 
I don't know, per, they obviously they're trying to pursue other avenues, they've said as well, like that RV USD or like sell some equity to people. Um, but personally, I don't personally see any value in that uh, in that scheme that they've come up with. I wouldn't want to put money into that personally. Um, so I don't uh, find it likely that other people would be willing to do the same thing either. And we haven't really seen any evidence um, that people are interested in that. Uh, we're just relying purely on what Mark Lamb has been saying in public about the situation. And what about crypto overall? Are we going to just grind out a bear market for the next two years and then it's going to kick off again in 2024 or 2025? Or are you jumping on the bandwagon of all these uh, disaffected BDC maxis who are saying that, oh, the four-year cycle, it was all a lie. It's not coming back, blah, blah, blah. That was just convenient at the time and we've changed our mind <laughs> or, or whatever. Uh, yeah, I don't know about that i think there's a lot of uncertainty uh with the global situation at the moment like there's freaking large uh war ongoing at the moment uh and it's the uh, us and the western countries versus uh russia uh they're just using ukraine as a proxy so if that escalates further uh there's going to be like nuclear exchanges taking place and uh, obviously the whole economy has been wrecked due to these uh, uh, lockdowns that have occurred in the last few years. Uh, the effects of that are only really just starting to come through now with all the increased prices and things. And so I think these global events are going to affect cryptocurrency prices negatively because given how much of the value of the crypto market has just been from people speculating and, um, you know, when they need the money to pay for like their everyday expenses and cost of living, they're going to cash out this speculative investments. And um, I think that's partially what we've been seeing happen already. Uh, so I think, uh, yeah, this is just, at the moment, a bit of a relief rally, but I think later this year, we'll see probably the worst of it toward the end of this year. Um, and after that, sense. I don't know how, how quick the recovery is going to be, but I would say toward the end of this year, and even like now, even now it's been pretty good uh, levels to stock up on some stuff, but certainly not like all in at these levels. Later this year, maybe like all, all in. Um, yeah, so... <laughs> I uh, I think we should wait and see what happens uh, later this year. And what about Australia? Obviously, I I'm curious on this angle specifically because I'm gonna go home probably at the end of the year for the first time in three or four years, and the chart of Australian money printing is just ridiculous. <laughs> like, uh, so I sort of have in my mind that I'm expecting to get home and because I have that that break, right? I've been thinking in pounds for several years that I'll get yeah. back and really be like, gosh, you know, a cup of coffee or whatever is truly ridiculously become expensive and that you just don't notice it sort of day by day. But when you have that gap, you you, you, you get a real shock of it. Do you, do you think that's happening in Australia? Is inflation oh, really, yeah. really kicking off? Of course. Um, I haven't bought a cup of coffee at a uh, like a, a store in a while, maybe like a year. Uh, if I want a coffee, I just make it at home because it's cheaper. But I remember that um, even up to like a year ago, the price of that kept creeping up higher and higher. And like just a few years ago, it was like, oh, maybe like $3 for, for a cup of coffee. And suddenly it's like more than $5, like $6 or something. Um and that was going back a year ago. I'm sure it's like much worse now. Uh, but yeah, obviously at the, I think the same thing taking place everywhere globally. Um, but yeah, it's certainly it's happening here too. Uh, at the grocery store, everything's going up. Um, and I think, you know, as the prices go up in certain industries, it has effects on other industries uh, who may have been lagging behind in their pricing, but then they'll be, all forced to uh, increase prices. That's just how it goes. 
Yeah, wow. That's going to be... And obviously, uh, the major, a lot of the major money printing was the government uh, in Australia. They did some really stupid things. Like, for example, I think it's still ongoing. Like, basically, anyone could just, like, go onto a government website and say, oh, I tested positive for COVID. And uh, they didn't really have to supply any kind of proof or anything. They just said it tests positive and I had to take time off work or something. And they would give you $700 like straight away. And basically from what I heard, there's like so many people have just been exploiting this sort of thing and basically they just take time off work and get paid. And uh, I'm sure that, uh, you know, this is where a lot of the printed money has been going to. Uh, through schemes like that yeah for the listeners that's 700 australian dollars which is what about 450 500 us dollars kind of kind of range, that's right? better than like what a lot of people get paid at their freaking job and they just get to sit home sit at home and watch netflix so of course many people are going to take advantage of that and i think it was probably done intentionally just to further wreck things Show, show me the incentive and I'll show you the outcome, right? That's just, it's kind of, if, if you give the option there, of course, people are going to take it. And yeah, you know, those, those, just those small, it's like a death by a thousand cuts. You know, you have a few people getting some free money here and there that's all been printed out. And then you have them uh, chilling at home rather than working in the economy. And it just, uh, yeah, sounds like a bit of a disaster, but uh, yeah, I'm going to be very curious right. to see. It. And I'll certainly the other thing, the, the other thing that you hear around a lot is that like uh, businesses are all struggling to find staff, and so <laughs> when the government is giving out all these handouts, like I only mentioned one scheme, there's like many more similar to that. Um, no wonder businesses can't find stuff because no one needs to go to work to survive anymore if they're just getting free handouts. And then people yeah. like me are the ones that are financing that and because uh, I, I pay taxes. And, um, yeah, anyone who's got savings in the bank account as well suffers because it's getting devalued with the money printing. It can't it can't hold up forever and i'm going to be very very interested to see what what the mood is like on the ground in australia to be honest because i yeah sometimes i talk to my friends and family and i i get mixed reports you know as to <laughs> as to how they're finding things or, or how things are going on the ground so yeah i'll certainly be be uh updating everyone on the situation uh when i check it out at the end of the year Right. So then next thing, uh, last kind of news topic uh, for this week is so USDC published some transparency stats. And I wanted to hit on this a little bit just because we've seen Tether sort of slowly reaching a point that USDC could maybe flip them out of there. And they've posted a, a sort of balance sheet that they have a bit 55.7 billion of res reserves and these uh treasury bonds and whatever that they've got in invested in obviously trying to look more legitimate than tether who have 65 billion but have very sketchy uh proof of their reserves and uh, yeah i wanted to get your take on stable coins and are we likely to see a tether blow up at, at some point are stable coins the future is this the precursor to the cbdc's what do you th what do you think of that um, I have not been a fan of stable coins for a long time. So I think I've been pretty critical of, uh, of Tether. Like I was warning people. I remember probably back in like 2017, 2018, I was running Bitcoin meetups and I was like warning people in presentations at these meetups about Tether and how it seems to be a huge, uh, fraudulent scheme. Um, but despite that, and despite the fact that that information is like widely available out there, it has just continued to exist. And, uh, you know, obviously I acknowledge that I have been wrong about the fact that uh, like it, it didn't implode immediately. But now, like, who knows how long this scheme can go on for because it's already been around for like more than five years and 
um, it hasn't imploded yet, even though the knowledge that it is a, a fraud basically is out there. So I don't know. I, I can't uh, make any further predictions. I've already been wrong on it. Um, I don't know what's going to happen with it. But I don't think personally I would be willing to hold any of it. I can say that much. Uh, definitely USDC seems a lot more trustworthy in comparison. So if you had to go into a stable coin for whatever reason, I would uh, prefer to be in that one personally. Um, and yeah, I I don't really know much about uh, other stable coins. Obviously, I kind of fell victim to the Flex USD uh, scheme <laughs> because I thought, oh yeah, these uh, Bitcoin Cash guys, they 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 should be trustworthy, you know. And uh, I have held Flex USD, but I don't hold it currently, luckily. Um, and yeah, uh, it's unfortunate what happened with that one. I think this is uh, the depegging and uh, losing the value of these stable coins is a very real risk, as we have now seen with uh, the Terror USD, Flex USD, and others. And yeah, you know, um, every time some event like that happens, uh, it is basically just giving uh, the government or the central bank more ammunition against us uh, for when they are ready to release their uh, central bank digital currencies and you know um, situations like that Terra, uh, Luna, they're going to use stuff like that obviously as evidence why um, we can't have decentralized cryptos, legit cryptos and why we must use their solution. And who knows, you know, they are very likely to be behind, uh, be behind or at least be financing some of these schemes um, because then they can use it to their advantage later on. Obviously, we know that uh, like that whole Bitfinex group and Tether, they have, and Blockstream, you know, like they've got investments from uh, some of these companies that are related to like MasterCard and stuff like that. So, you know, the evidence is already out there that they they are certainly involved in cryptocurrencies and blockchains and they know what's going on. And yeah, they, they could just be playing, they're playing a game of chess. And um, I think, yes, very soon they will be revealing themselves. And I think it will coincide with when all the fiat currencies start to uh, go into big hyperinflation and uh, collapse, basically, which we haven't really seen yet, but it's probably not too far away. Um, and that's when I think they will come out and they'll be like, oh, we've got the solution. And they will act like the saviors um, to the problems that people are being faced with. And uh, it's probably going to trick a lot of people uh, based on what I've seen in recent years. Uh, it's not hard to uh, deceive the average person with these kind of tactics. And yeah, they're probably going to uh, get some uh, substantial luck with that. But I'm sure there will be groups who are uh, opposing that sort of thing when, it, when the time comes. Yeah, it's certainly... Uh scary world that we find ourselves in you know i mean in given hindsight in five years or, or 10 years who who knows what the the world is going to be like at at that stage but there's certainly plenty of reason to be suspicious of of how things are going along and in the worst case scenario if we don't manage to make it work as the Bitcoin cash community as the crypto community as sort of the more freedom minded people of the world generally there's no doubt that the clock is ticking and sooner or later it's going to be well here's the government solution so if we haven't got enough momentum going by then yeah it's going to be done yeah it could uh, it could already be over for all we know like uh the situation that happened with the BTC and BCH 
split. It's probably all over Maybe since that was then. <laughs> um, I saw. Yeah. I sure hope not. I, I'm I'm an optimist, but if if it if it doesn't fly, when the in retrospect, I think that'll be that'll be pointed out as the test that we failed <laughs> for sure. But uh, pretty much, you never know. Okay, um, all right. Yeah, go on. Another interesting thing that I've seen recently is like you would think that with all the inflation going on that some assets like oh gold and silver like even cryptos would be going up but they've actually been going down recently and it seems like the best thing that you could have invested in was like food something like that because it's been going up a lot um but yeah i think that uh the reason why these assets have been declining is as i've mentioned before People are just speculating on it. And as the cost of living goes up, they need to cash out to pay. But I don't know. I, I would um, hope that uh, later down the track, they do go up. Maybe when the dollar really starts uh, to crumble later, uh, people might be looking for something that is, um, or if they can't get money out of the bank or something like that, they might be looking for a way to transact. And then obviously the cryptos are the solution, but. We'll have to see. It's certainly like a lot of uncertainty um, surrounding the whole situation at the moment. Yeah. Uh, um, <laughs> may you live in interesting times. You know, sometimes people say, well, I think we're definitely going to get our money's worth on that, if, if, if nothing else. So I've got here a little bit of hopium just because we had to, had to mix in some optimism into the show. Uh, definitely from Callisti in comment of the week who posted in the BCH uh, prize channel. Max asked, what makes you so bullish on BCH? Why not ETH, BTC, etc.? Callisti said, one, it's Bitcoin. Two, everything that isn't Bitcoin is basically Ethereum, excluding Litecoin, Doge, and Monero. Smart BCH is, t- is a technically superior implementation of Ethereum. Its premise is maximize hardware and parallelization to improve performance. Four, no other crypto competes with Bitcoin in purpose or function other than Bitcoin clones, forks, and stable CBDC. Altogether, pre-fork Bitcoin fundamentals, post-fork improvements, highly performant EVM ch- sidechain, cash fusion. We have everything that every other crypto offers, all the strengths and none of the drawbacks. Our biggest weakness are brain drain, which is reversing, poor community image, which is reversing both in our own demeanor as well as BTC narratives collapsing, and lack of price hash adoption, which is a multi fashion multifaceted issue that can be boiled down to keep building end quotes so I, I i just thought this was a good take to throw in there because it does seem to me like all the problems that bch has are it, it's kind of all all interlinked right if like you were saying about smart bch uh when it was the it was releasing and the momentum was building if the momentum starts rising if the price starts rising if the hash rate comes back if you know everybody in the scene gets energized all these things can play off each other and given that yeah we are on a clock uh i sort of think it it, maybe it needs to happen in a sort of a organically rising tide that turns into a big surge um that's certainly the scenario that i'm hoping and working on but uh yeah i don't know if you if you think that's that's realistic do you see do you see a big flipping if we can fix one or two areas can we make the run back what's your take um i don't know i agree with like everything that that guy said and that stuff is true but uh i think the reality is that clearly people don't care about that sort of thing otherwise they would be buying and using uh bitcoin cash right now um so i think that some kind of event is going to need to happen that uh, creates a giant need for Bitcoin Cash. And I think only then is when we can expect some kind of uh, flippening. But right now, uh, people people clearly don't care about that stuff. They don't value that stuff. Yeah, that's it. The crypto casino uh, rages on. Yes. Next thing, meme of the week. <laughs> We've got this one. It's the meme of uh, Bane against uh filthy frank the guy in the pink suit uh, this strange combo uh meme where you're not exactly sure whether they're about to have a fight to the death 
or they're about to hug each other. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think that's kind of part of the joke of these, <laughs> these meme template. And Bane is labeled 9.1% inflation and filthy Frank pink guy is labeled $1.50 Costco hot dog. And I, this one just made me laugh. And obviously we've been talking about inflation, but it's kind of like people have these things that they think of as the cheap thing, like $2 ramen noodles or $1.50 hot dogs or $1, you know, whatever things that you can buy at the $1 shop or whatever. And at some point, one of those things has to break, right? If inflation keeps going higher, eventually those prices just have to go up. And I can see that as being one of the things people really trigger them to think, oh, you know, like like retailers will often uh, lost lead on those products because they're known to be, oh, the cheap thing that you can just kind of get by on. But once the pressure is too high of inflation, they just have to raise those costs. I can really see that starting to wake people yeah. up. Um, yeah. I don't they're they're probably... Definitely not making any money on that. As you say, they're probably losing money on that, but it's just something that is there to attract people to the store to spend money on other things, I think. So, <laughs> but yeah, we'll see what happens. Um, they, they have to can't. change the price. Yeah, they can't. All, even the cheap stuff can't stay, can't stay cheap forever. And once those prices start going up, you really know that the crunch is on, that uh, shit's hitting the fan there. Okay, final segment. As always, message to the community, open platform, whatever you think listeners to this show, the Bitcoin Cash community needs to hear. What's what's the message? From me? <laughs> yeah, from you. I think, what, do, uh, what, do, what do people need to know? I don't know. I think that uh, one of the things that I think are most important is what I was saying earlier about the merchant adoption stuff. I think uh, that should probably be less of a focus uh, because it's not really yielding any great results. Like this has been tried for a long time now. There's like many problems with it. Um, and it only costs uh, resources and time and nothing's like coming out of it as a result. So you have to work out a way to um, either resolve the problems that I discussed there um, or, or find something else to invest that time, money and effort into, um, which will hopefully have a greater effect on the price. I think that, um, you know, uh, our BTC is a bit of an echo chamber. So, you know, if you want to promote that sort of thing, why and uh, make it bullish for Bitcoin Cash. Why do it there? Why not go somewhere else where, like, you can spread the word to people that don't know anything about it? I think that should be a greater focus as well. Um, and of course, like making YouTube videos and things like that, uh, you'll probably reach a wider audience and spread the word better um, in that way as well. And that's part of the reason why I started making videos years ago because no one else was really doing it and so yeah i commend people who are doing that sort of thing like you guys as well you and jet um i think we need more of that uh so for for example like if you go onto the youtube platform and you're searching um for like other popular coins there'd be like way more youtubers uh discussing these coins than there are bitcoin cash so i think the more the merrier in that regard and yes online you reach way more people than you can um just going like one-on-one -on -one to merchants this is not having as great an effect and you know you might find uh that some business owners come across your video and they decide to become passionate about it and they decide to start accepting it on their own accord um as a result of watching your video um and yeah that's uh you're achieving multiple different things um, by just doing that one thing instead of having to do many things. Yeah, I agree. Certainly some kind of online strategy and focus. Uh, obviously, that's the, all the content and stuff I'm doing is, is, is in that direction. And I think if we can pair that with, yeah, with some kind of uh, viral app, I don't know exactly what that's going to be yet, but if somebody can hit on the magic 
uh, formula for like some sort of slick app or something that BCH has maybe integrated a bit behind the scenes or it's sort of an add-on to what the app already does or something like that. If we can get that going as well, then maybe the merchant adoption and, and whatever would 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 flow from that given that that's something that the community already has experience in. It's just missing the yeah. X factor to really make it go go viral, I think. All right. Uh, another good thing is like the... Yeah or Bitcoin.com wallet, for example, like I think they're probably the top rated uh, or top result for Bitcoin wallet on the app stores. And like they've taken an approach that they were criticized for uh, where they like supported multiple coins instead of just BCH only. But I think it turns out that's kind of the smart uh, approach to take. And as a result of that, you will probably expose more people to uh, Bitcoin Cash that were not previously aware of it. So I think, uh, I don't know, more services should do that if you're like a BCH only service. And uh, if you're bringing in users from other other coins, then yeah, potentially you can uh, convince them or expose them to Bitcoin Cash. And then they discover how uh, superior it is to uh, compared to whatever they were using previously. So, yeah. Don't be too insular. Good point. Definitely a good point. All right. And that kind of does it for the show. Then we've got our final slide. As always, people can donate to the QR code. They can read the start guide and the FAQ and find all the links for the podcast and everything at bitcoincashpodcast.com. Shout out to the chat to Dick Pete. Uh, shout out to you commenting in there at the end thanks to my patron ricky and final shout outs do you have anybody you want to give a special mention to hayden and where can people find you to follow more of your stuff uh yeah you can find me um on youtube you search for hayden auto you'll see my channel come up there um also haydenauto.com that's, that's it, it. Jet. Any any shout out for this week? And yeah, I don't really have. Ready? I'll send you. To... I'll send you a BCH tip <laughs> right I now. I love it. We've had a few guests do that, and that that definitely does yeah. kind of show the Oops. power of it, right? Boom. That's it. All you need is so uh, that that still is like a, an amazing edge that crypto has. I mean, banking apps have improved a bunch with uh, instant send and lower fees and all that stuff. When crypto came out it was so far ahead but it's now been delayed enough that the banks have caught up uh, a lot but uh, some of that stuff with just donating to qr codes and uh tip bots in like on reddit and in telegram and stuff like that i think that's another area i think people could really if they can polish those up and stuff that's the kind of thing that can go uh viral even just within a small community of, of people and and build up quite a lot of online transactions and a lot of lot of interest so yeah maybe anybody who's involved in that have a think about it but that'll do it for this week till next time the greatest story the world has ever known the rise and rise of bitcoin 2022 a single chance for the world, a single moment in time Bankers capture us all, our cryptocurrency flies Gets to decide, Phoenix fly from the flame Bitcoin BCH, forever changing the game An underdog story, everyone trying to deny Bitcoin revolution, crypto trader